let me just tell you one quick story here. Anybody know who this is? Good. Sometimes people will say Buffalo Bill, something like that. This is uh, George Armstrong Custer, pretty handsome guy, pretty dapper looking guy. Graduated last in his class at West Point at the age of uh, 22. Two years later, at the age of last in his class, not for stupidity, but for the amount of demerits he had. He was a very high strung, he's continually you know, penalized for being kind of wild, whatever. Two years later, after graduating last in his class, he is a two-star general reporting directly to Philip Sheridan, commander of the United States Cavalry in the Civil War. So as, again, not being a military person, but even I can figure out that's a pretty rapid rise after graduating two years. Um, he's, he's moved farther than the person who graduated first in this class. He is continually cited by his management during the Civil War for outstanding bravery in action. He's a very a loud dresser. He, the army in the 1860s was quite different from today. If you could get somebody to sew your uniform, you could wear it. This is a non-regulation navy collar. He has a bright red uh, bandana that he wears. His hair, even for that time, was long. This is a hat he designed. His idea was he was always in front of his troops. He wanted them to see that he was there. He wanted them to recognize him. So he had this long blonde hair, this sort of flaming red hair, this bandana, whatever, this sort of elaborate costume. He wanted them to see him. He had 11 horses shot out from under him during the Civil War. Probably not very popular in the equine community, but you know, <laughs> continually cited by his management for bravery under fire. When the surrender is signed at Appomattox Courthouse between Grant and Lee, Grant takes the table on which the surrender is signed and gives it to Philip Sheridan. Philip Sheridan gave it to George Armstrong Custer. Has anybody ever, uh, anybody, anybody here from Chicago, did we say? Okay, uh, so, well, okay, but you've been to Sheridan Road, right? So you can go to Sheridan Road and you can see the largest statue in the world to one of the shortest men in history. There is a classic picture of Philip Sheridan standing next to his team of officers, all of whom are sitting. He's the exact same height standing as they are sitting. He's this little tiny dynamo. And one of those officers is George Armstrong Custer. Sheridan is just a, 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 a maniac and just a great officer. Anyway, so Custer continually cited for bravery. Courage under fire, he plays a pivotal role in the Battle of Gettysburg in holding off this, this Southern Cavalry. Most people don't know that. They hear about Pickett's Charge. Anybody know Pickett's Charge? Okay, Pickett's Charge, where they you know, charge up the hill, they get slaughtered. And people think, oh, Lee, he was crazy. What was he doing? Well, Lee had a plan. Was Pickett was charging across this open field, and on the other side of the battlefield, Jeb Stuart was going to attack with cavalry the back half of the Union Army. The people who held them off was a young 24-year-old general named George Armstrong Custer. Anyway. Fast forward, Custer's then sent to the West uh, after the war. People who stayed in the army get sent to the West. He, uh, his policy uh, when he first moves to the West is to protect the Indians in the Black Hills. Custer's experience with the Indian uh, is quite different from what you've seen in movies. Uh, the cavalry never rides in in the last minute. Uh, it is a hopeless situation. It is huge pieces of territory. He has very few troops. The cavalry in the West is, is basically 50% desertion rate. They're eating food in the 1870s that was packaged in the 1860s. They're eating hardtack that was packaged for the Civil War. You can imagine what food would be like today, 10 years old. You can imagine in the 1870s what food is like that's 10 years old. You're eating canned food that has lead sealant on it. All right, so a lot of the people are immigrants. Um, the, the last known uh, person who speaks to Custer at the Battle of the Little Bighorn is an Italian immigrant who doesn't speak English. And he's getting the orders from Custer to go get uh, support. So that's the world that Custer lives in. Custer's Indian experience is, again, quite different from the movies. The Indians never stand and fight. They're never confronted. They're, they're very intelligent people. They know they're not going to stand up against a bunch of blue coats and shoot it out with them. So their tactic is to disperse in all different directions, so it's very hard to track them down. They then regroup at some other time. But so if you're trying to confront these people, you don't know which way to go. That's the, his experience with them. 
And of course, his original orders in the West are to protect the Indians who are in the Black Hills uh, and give that to them as a sacred burial ground. His job is to keep the miners out of the Black Hills. The land has been ceded to the Indian for eternity. Unfortunately for the Indian, eternity comes quite quickly when gold is discovered in the Black Hills and Custer's orders change, which is then to get the Indians out of the Black Hills and back onto a reservation. So in 1876, with three other generals, he is sent to the West to bring to bear a large uh, Indian party that is thought to be out there. He rides at the head of his uh, group. He's reporting to a man named uh, Terry. Uh, Terry says, you know, Custer, you're going to go ahead. I'll follow you about a day behind with a you know, large train of supplies and troops and whatever, infantry. But Custer then rides off ahead with his Indian scouts, uh, follows a large pony track. His Indian scouts said, this is a huge pony track, General Custer. We've never seen anything like this. So they follow it literally for three days, full out, no breaks, little running out of water, running out of food, running out of ammunition. Uh, and they come up to a high ridge, and the Indian scouts look out and say, General Custer, this is about the largest Indian encampment I have, we have ever seen. And Custer said they believe his view is somewhat skewed by the geography. He says, well, it's not the largest encampment I've ever seen. And anyway, it doesn't matter. These people know we're here. And we've been riding across the plains here for three days. They've seen us coming. And, you know, we, we haven't stopped, you know, for two days. They've smelled us probably for the last, you know, day and a day. They know we're here. And this village is going to break up at any minute. They're going to disperse. We cannot wait for Terry to get here. This village is going to disperse. So we're going to have to do something now because I'm not doing this all summer. So Colonel Benteen, you are going to ride to the south and you are going to hold these people off when they start to move that way. Major Reno, you are going to ride into this village and initiate this action. And I will take 200 troops and I will ride to the north of this village and we will encircle them and we will hold them here until Terry gets here. Because I'm not doing this all summer. So let's go. Well, in fact, Custer did have a wrong view of the side of the village because he doesn't ride to the north of the village. He, in fact, rides into the middle of the village, which he thinks is the end. And at the head of 200 troops, he rides into a village of 6,000 warriors who in the great history of American entrepreneurship are better armed than his troops are. The Indians have been sold repeating uh, Winchester rifles by entrepreneurs in the West. The United States Cavalry is uh, using single-shot carbines and a knife. The knife is not to hurt anybody. The knife is to extract the shells which have been supplied by the low bidder so that they're all irregular and the rifles tend to jam, whereas normally they could get six shots off in a minute, they now get about one or two off because these rifles are jamming all the time. You can imagine what's going through his head as he's backing up a hillside with 6,000 somewhat perturbed warriors coming right at him. His whole family basically dies with him. His brother, Tom Custer, one of the only people in the history of the United States to win two Congressional Medals of Honor, dies with him. His brother Boston Custer dies with him. His cousin Audie Custer dies with him. His wife has to be physically restrained from going on this campaign with him because she cannot stand to be separated from him. He's court-martialed once in his career. What for? Leaving his troops to be with her because he cannot stand to be separated from her. Probably not the worst thing in life to be court-martialed for. So the problem is that Custer had is that he saw his future based on his past. He said, this is what has been successful for me in the past. This is how these people have reacted in the past. This is what they have done. And if I just keep doing more of what I've done, what more that has made me successful, I will be even more successful in the future. And that's the trap. Because the world suddenly changed. And he learned it far too late. I mean, he's literally there shooting their horses for cover as they back up this hillside. If you're in the cavalry and you're shooting your horses for cover, where are you going? You're not going anywhere. You're finished. So that's the point. That's the point that I just want to leave you with. You cannot think that what worked for us in the past is what's going to keep working for us. That the world as we knew it, that we became comfortable with, this is the way the world is going to be. We just need to do more of it. We need to do more of it quicker, faster, whatever. That's a trap. The world is changing. It's rapidly changing now. And we need to keep our hands on that pulse. And one of the ways I would encourage us all to do this is through this idea of patient focus, customer focus, and use that as a strategic advantage.